Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome founder of Instructables, Eric Wilhelm. Good afternoon. Welcome to Everyone is a Designer. So I'm the founder of Instructables.com. Instructables is a place where you can explore, document, and share your creations. So my story of becoming a designer, and actually the story of Instructables started when I was finishing my doctorate. I took up the, the sport of kite surfing, which is where you take a giant kite and a surfboard and you have it drag you out into the ocean. It's, kind of, it's a perfect sport for an engineer because you can build all your own gear. And when I was starting, it was the infancy of the sport. So I was hand sewing all my own kites and building all my own surfboards and kiteboards. I'd turn up at the beach with all this hand-built equipment and half of it would perform brilliantly and half of it would fail spectacularly, but you never knew which half. So the Coast Guard was involved on multiple occasions. <laughs> While doing this, I was documenting everything that I built on my personal website. People would contact me and ask to meet me at the beach to get my CAD files, to get more information about what I was doing. And it was very clear that there was a need for a place to document what you do and to, help, and to connect with others. And the other problem was that it was taking me just as long to write a web page about a kiteboard as it was to actually build it. Now, six years later, uh, we have 85,000 projects on Instructables, and they're all authored by passionate amateur experts. So I'm confident that everyone has an Instructable in them, whether it be simple, something like how to tie your shoes or a family recipe, or something more complicated, say a robot or a haunted house. There's something that you know how to do that others will find inspiring, and, they'll, and they want to understand your story. So today, we're going to explore people becoming designers. And I think the, the basis of this is the barriers to making things and to raising money have been erased. With CAD tools that are just good enough and with tools that can raise just the right amount of money and even take pre-orders, and then finally, rapid prototyping tools like 3D printers and laser cutters, you can build a prototype that you can take into real life and you can test and you can figure out whether your design is also good enough. So now, I think that most of you recognize that the real value is in execution. Ideas are cheap and plentiful. And so value is built by that iterating, that testing, and the doing it over and over to figure out whether your design actually works. So now, if the cost to prototyping, to iterating, to, to testing approaches zero, what does that mean? Does that mean that we can all forge a deeper relationship with the things that are around us because we know how they're made and because we know how to make them ourselves? So today we have five stories of people exploring those new technologies and, take it and going on that journey of becoming a designer. Our first story comes from David Lang. David Lang is an explorer. Over the past year, he's been transforming himself from useful only behind a computer to an expert on every machine in a woodworking shop, a metalworking shop, or a rapid prototyping shop. Along the way, he's also co-founded OpenROV, which is a community of DIY ocean explorers. And they're working on building a low-cost, open-source, underwater robotic platform. David's raised over $100,000 to, to build the first run of these robots. So you'll have to forgive David if he runs off immediately after this session because to beg time on the 3D printers and the laser cutters in the Creative Studio. His partner is actually in Antarctica right now, awaiting parts from David so they can fly one of their robots under an ice shelf. Please welcome David Lang. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Lang. Thank you, Eric and Autodesk, for having me here. I have to admit, I am a little nervous about getting up here and telling a room full of architects and engineers that everyone can be a designer because I myself am really just, just an amateur. So um, I'm going to tell you about my story and how my life has unfolded over the past couple of years and how that might kind of fit into this larger context of everyone becoming a designer. So to 
I'm going to do this a little differently than I normally do. I'm going to start the story in the middle. I'm going to start it right here. So this is May of this year. This is inside of a cave up in Northern California in the Trinity Alps. So we're about eh, 75 feet inside the cave. Um, as you can see, we have quite the operation. We've got um, a generator. We've got lights. We've got monitors. Uh, but most importantly, we have an underwater robot that we've built, designed and built. Um, what you can't see in this picture is a little bit, probably 30 feet to the, to the right, deeper down the cave, is this small, it looked like almost a puddle of water at the end of the cave. Um, but when you walked up to it and you flash your light into it, it goes down deeper than, deeper than the flashlight could illuminate. That was our goal. That was our target. We had heard stories about a robbery in the gold rush where a gold mining operation was robbed and the, the bounty was stored in, this, um, in the back of this cave. We read online about treasure hunters and cave divers, all these different people who had gone up to this cave and tried to get the treasure, but no one had made it out to the bottom. So we went up there with our robot with the goal of trying to find this treasure. So I'm going to go back a little bit. This is my, my friend and, and really my hero. This is Eric Stackpole. I wanted to insert this, um, this photo. This is him in Antarctica that Eric just mentioned. Uh, he sent me this photo last week. He's, this is an ice trench that he dug that he's actually sleeping in. So he's, um, he's just an amazing guy. I met Eric about a year before that cave trip. A mutual friend introduced us and thought we would really get along. Um, and he told me that cave story. The cave was a few miles from where he grew up and, and he just lit up when he told me this story. I mean, he had characters and voices and big expressive gestures and it was really, I was just taken. I, and I wanted to participate. He even showed me this prototype, this product that he had this robot that he had started to create. Um, it's funny to look at this now because it's, you know, this is, was the very, very first thing we ever created. And um, it's come so far, that thing actually never worked. Um, but, you know, Eric, I was just hooked. The only problem was I didn't have any skills. I mean, I was really, at the time, I was working for a, a startup in Los Angeles, and I was just, I was in marketing and customer service, which, as many of you know, really means that I just replied to emails all day. So I was just really horribly underskilled, um, and I wanted, I just, you know, I wanted to take part, so I, just, I convinced Eric to create this site where we would share our designs and make this an open source project and invite people to collaborate. I told him I would help with the website and on the forums and things like that, and he agreed. And so OpenROV was, was born from there. And then something happened. About two months after that, three months after that, I lost my job. The startup that I was working for ran out of money, as happens, and, and I found myself without a job. But more importantly, I found myself just feeling really underskilled and I decided that I wanted to become a DIY industrial designer. I didn't really know what that meant, but I just had this idea in my head, and I wanted to start contributing to the, to the robot project. So I committed to a month. I said, I'm going to take a month, and I'm just going to learn as many skills as I can. I'm not going to race back into a job. I'm just going to learn these skills. So I showed up at Tech Shop, and I told them my plan. I said, I want to I start taking classes, and I want to learn this stuff. And they were, everyone at Tech Shop was great. Make Magazine even let me write about this whole ordeal. And I started taking these classes. I started with welding classes and wood shop, the traditional tools. But then I moved into 3D printing and laser cutting. And, you know, pretty soon by the, by the end of the month and then into two months and three months, we kept, you know, working on this robot project. And a few more people heard about the, what we were doing and started contributing. And this, this transformation really happened. And then we went to the cave. And then that story got picked up by the New York Times, and more people got interested. We decided to put the project up on Kickstarter. We raised over $100,000, and now this week we're sending out 150 of these kits all over the world of these underwater robots. So this, you know, this quest to reskill myself turned into this amazing adventure. You know, it's, it's this fledgling underwater robot business. We're having all kinds of fun. This is us testing the robot at, with NASA at Aquarius, the underwater reef base off the coast of Florida. Um, so, More importantly than, than the robot is this community that we found around the world. So we have you know, a couple of thousand people who are contributing to the design. I woke up this morning to a guy, uh, to new code from, from Italy of someone who had uh, programmed an Xbox 360 controller to control the robot. And this is some, these are things I wake up to every day, and it just, it just, it's amazing. It's amazing to be a part of it. It's this kind of radical collaboration that's happening. Um, so what happened? I mean, what really, 
what really changed for me over those years, over the past year. I mean, so obviously there's now the robot exists and there's this community, but, but thinking back on it, my personal journey, what really happened was that I learned a few lessons. There's three big ones that I like to talk about. The first one is that this, this maker movement um, and this democratization of design is nothing about DIY. This is all about doing things together. Um, every step of the way, as soon as I showed up at Tech Shop, you know, as soon as we posted ideas about our robot online, we found that there was a community of people, individuals all over the world, who were willing to help. You know, when I showed up at Tech Shop and pointed out a tool, so there was someone there to show me the tricks and the nuances to how to use that tool. So everything about this process for me has been collaboration. So I'm, I'm always hesitant to use that term DIY because I, I don't think it's accurate. The next thing I learned was that these were not my grandfather's tools. When I, when I made this commitment, I thought, you know, maybe this is going to be like the shop class that I didn't have in my high school. You know, maybe just reskilling myself, just being a carpenter or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I found that these 3D printers and laser cutters were not, not my grandfather's tools at all. These were really, really powerful tools, not only for prototyping and easy to learn tools, but something that you can actually do production runs. I mean, we do all of our, we made almost all of our first batch, first production of robots at Tech Shop. I mean, these tools are very capable of actually making stuff and then selling it. So the last thing I learned, and this one was really important, this was a, a, a big switch from the way I grew up and the way I learned. I, in school, they try to teach you everything and they give you a few uh, questions on a test that kind of go over the entire textbook. What I found is that making is not like that. You just learn whatever you need to when you need to learn it. So Neil Gershenfeld in his class at MIT talked about this intellectual pyramid scheme. He talked about just-in-time learning. And that's exactly what I found, is that I only learned things exactly when I needed to learn them. If there, was a, if there was a process or something I needed done, I would bring that information into me. So when I, when I started, I only wanted to learn enough to be dangerous. But what I found was that was totally enough. It's just kind of beginning to um, break the threshold of what's possible. So I like to describe it like this. It's kind of like the Donald Rumsfeld quote. You have the stuff that you know, the stuff that you know you don't know, and the stuff that you don't know you don't know. So for me, Getting to, getting, learning enough to be dangerous is all about expanding that yellow sliver, about learning, learning what you don't know, so having a, a grasp of what's possible. Because I think that's what this is about, this maker movement, is about exploring what's possible. And so when I think about this, this really bold idea that everyone is a designer, to me, what it means is that we're all exploring this together. So you know, when you guys go and, and build products and, and design uh, architecture, I think that this idea that everyone is a designer is this idea that everyone can participate in the process. I don't do everything. I mean, I didn't design everything on that robot, but there were things that I contributed to, and that's what this is about. So um, I also want to encourage you all, um, when I started this, I thought there was going to be gold at the bottom of the cave. I didn't really think so. But what Eric and I found, that there was a much richer treasure in this community of collaborators around the world. So I encourage you guys all to go out and find your own treasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, David. So our next speaker is a regular speaker on the subject of 3D printing, computers, and electronics. He's also in middle school. Skylar St. Ledger is, embodies to me a theme that I think we really need to explore, which is the ability of youth to learn and to push boundaries on new technology. So in the same way that I'm envious of those that grew up bilingual or trilingual and never had to struggle to learn a new language later in life, Skylar already has fluency with technologies that are poised to change the way we design and potentially much more. And the rest of us, we're still speaking with accents. So what really sets Skylar apart is his desire to share and teach. He really wants us to take, he really wants to take us on the journey with him, and he wants us to make something. Please welcome Skylar St. Ledger. Skylar, if the tank wasn't already uh, impressive and imposing enough, the, the lift.
Good afternoon. My name is Skylar St. Ledger. I'm here to talk to you about my path to becoming a designer and a maker and how, the, and how everybody will be a designer soon. What was the first book that you read that was over a thousand pages? For most people, it was, or most kids my age, it was the Harry Potter series. By the time you get to year four at Hogwarts, you've surely read over a thousand pages. For me, it was the Granger catalog. All 4,482 pages of it. Can we go back? Oh, back. Back again. Yeah. I was amazed by the things in there, from oil and coolant separators to CNC cutting heads. These things were amazing to me because they opened a whole new world of things that I never knew existed. From there, I went on to learn how to use analog devices, like a slide rule or vernier calipers. I thought these devices were so cool because you could calculate num with numbers or measure things without needing any batteries. Back, oh, I'm not finished yet. Okay. Do any of you know what I'm doing on the slide rule? I'm multiplying pi times two and getting 6.28. How cool is that? From there, I wanted to learn how to use more tools. So I started reading online, and, I all, and then for my Christmas list, I asked for soldering irons and screwdrivers and a multimeter. How many of you recognize this photo? For those of you that don't, it's the 1969 launch of Apollo 11. It's the rocket that took Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins to the moon. The interesting thing about this was in both the lunar module and the com command module, Apollo had this compute, NASA had this computer in there called the Apollo Guidance Computer, or AGC. The really interesting thing about it is the com processing power of the AGC is less than that of today's Arduino Uno. The Uno has 20 times more processing power and uses three orders of magnitude less power consumption. The Arduino is a really great prototyping platform, and I'd actually like to talk to you about some of my projects with it. We, leave, we live in Phoenix, Arizona. The summer temperatures of 110 degrees Fahrenheit, or 43 degrees Celsius, require us to have a, a Bermuda grass lawn. But in the winter, this lawn goes dormant. So to have a green, a green lawn for the holidays, we have to plant winter grass. But the birds have figured this out, and they see my dad leaving the Home Depot parking lot with the grass seed. After our dad spreads the grass seed, this is our backyard and what it looks like. The whole flock of birds lands and start to eat the seed. My dad typically has to spread the grass seed down two or three times to actually get enough grass to grow. Seeing this happen year after year, I was determined to find something better. So I decided to build something with the Arduino. I started out our sprinkler controller box to figure out how does it work. It turns out it uses about 24 volts AC at 200 to 300 milliamps to drive the solenoids to turn on the sprinklers. Then I prototyped the circuit to try and get it to drive the sprinklers. I have a triac to actually control the sprinkler, and then the Arduino Uno I'm using to run the triac. Currently, I'm having some issues with getting it, work, getting it to work, but I'm going to try more when I get home. With this, I hope to eventually add a wireless motion, a motion detector so it detects when the birds land, and also a wireless remote so I can spray my sister and brother when I'm mad at them. The birds will never know what hit them with this. Now I'd like to talk to you about 3D printing. This is the MakerBot Industries Cupcake CNC. This was the first 3D printer that I owned. This 3D printer I, ha I got back in 2010, and I loved it. This was my first print. It was a whistle. It is so great to have. It actually prints the ball inside it, 
so you can pop it out and you have a whistle with a ball in it. I've probably printed hundreds of these to give away to kids like me who thought this was so, that my 3D printer was a cool thing too. I gave a presentation on, at Ignite Phoenix on my 3D printer. It's an event sort of like TEDx. For it, I decided why not make a keychain and 3D print it if I'm speaking about my 3D printer. So I got their 2D logo and I used Google SketchUp Pro to make it into a 3D key fob. I ended up using a lot of tools, including Google SketchUp Pro, Inkscape, Adobe Photoshop Elements, Replicator G, and Skyforge to get the final, that, the final key chain. From there, I then went, I then, I then did a conference with my dad and he works at Intel. So I decided, why not make an Intel keychain? Here, what's really great about here is MakerBot, they developed a new printer. The top left one was done on my Thingamatic. That, you can see it's pretty good quality, but it's a little rough. The bottom one was done on a MakerBot, it was done on a MakerBot replicator. The MakerBot replicator has, first of all, much better print quality, as you can tell. And the other cool thing about it is it has dual print heads. So you can actually make parts in two colors. For Autodesk University, I decided, why not make a badge for it? So that's what I did. The white badge, I, I, designed, I designed these badges in Inventor, and then I went to print them out except the badge is too big to fit on the build area of my thingamatic. So I went to ASU and I asked Dr. Bizzaconi at, an, at the bioengineering lab if we could borrow his $35,000 Dimension SST 1200ES because at $35,000, it's out of my 12-year-old budget. So, and then, so I got that and it looked good and then except they can only do white because they're funded by grants and they can't buy a bunch of colors. So MakerBot, I was able, they were, Nate at MakerBot was nice enough to print me this red badge on their Replicator 2, which has even better print quality than the first Replicator. 3D printers are really hard and hot in the startup industry. This is the form one. This 3D printer was created by people at in, pe some college students who wanted a higher quality 3D printer for low cost and they weren't satisfied with what printers like MakerBot offered. So they made a printer that uses a laser to cure UV resin and then it builds the object that way. That's called SLA. With SLA you can get extremely high quality parts. Now you're probably wondering, where did I learn all of this? Well, I'm sorry to say, but none of it came from my formal public school education. Not even simple equations like Ohm's Law are taught in schools. If you're lucky, it might be taught in middle school, but most students probably won't learn this until college. I'm lucky though, not because of school, but because of my mom. She's an electrical engineer, and she's willing to spend time to teach me equations like these. Thanks, Mom! Can we go back one? Yeah. When a maker like me wants to go figure, learn more knowledge, we go on to online, not to school. We'll go to Make and Adafruit and Instructables and SparkFun. They all have great documentation on just about anything a maker like me would want to learn about. Now, you're, now I'm also wondering, what will my education look like when I get to college? Well, I'm hoping that my education will be free. If any of you have kids who are in college, you're probably hoping that too. MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and Berkeley are behind programs like these. These are hopefully going to be big enough that I can take most of my college education through courses, through places like these, when I get to college. But there are some things like a lab that just can't be made virtual. I like to have a little different spin on do-it-yourself. I like to think of it as 
design it yourself and make it yourself. Because when you do something yourself, you first have to design it, then you have to build that design. But I like to add another spin on this. I like to do, do it, I like to say do it with others, just like David said in his previous talk. You don't just do it by yourself, you go to have a, find a community and they help you with it. I hope you learned something from my talk. I'd really like you to get out there and make something. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I can't keep my eyes off this thing. I'm intimidated by it. This past summer, Rachel Starr and Jason Chua and their team outfitted a delivery truck with modern rapid prototyping tools and drove it around the country visiting 33 states. And they helped bring these technologies for the first time to over 2,700 students. The project started as a thesis project at Stanford's D School and with a successful fundraising campaign expanded to a whole summer of driving around, learning to park a giant delivery truck full of tools and teaching kids what they could do with these new, these new tools. So Jason and Rachel join us here today to talk about Spark Truck. Please welcome Jason and Rachel. So, as he was saying, we spent all summer working with kids across the country. And one of the things that we liked to ask them when we first met them was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we heard a whole range of answers. The, the typical answers were firefighter, baseball player, we got a few kids that wanted to be engineers. But the thing that really struck Jason and I about this whole thing was that the jobs that most of these kids are going to have when they graduate college don't even exist yet. So the question that we asked was how can we and how can all of you as educators and other people that interact with these students, how can we prepare them for this world that they're going to enter when we don't even know what it's going to look like? So this is where design really comes in and where it's important for everyone to become a designer so that when we enter this world that who knows what it's going to look like, we're prepared to create a problem solve and figure out how to interact with everything. So we've been lucky to spend some time learning environments that really foster design mindsets. So these are pictures of the D School at Sanford, and you can see there's a lot of whiteboards, post-its, and there's a lot of space for us to build, imagine, and start creating some of our new ideas. But the thing is that the D School is a place for college students and grad students to do some learning. So when we had a chance, as part of a year-long capstone project, to work on whatever we wanted, we wanted to see how people were learning um, in younger grades, at, at a younger age. So our team spent the first couple months of our project hang out at elementary and middle schools, talking with teachers, parents, and students about how things were going. And what we found was that there was a huge amount of anxiety and stress about getting people ready for the 21st century. There was a lot of talk about how to be innovative, how to be creative, and how to foster critical thinking skills. At the same time, however, we saw that increasing standards and more rigid curricula was making it really difficult for people to have fun and be engaged well in the classroom. So we're designers and makers ourselves, and we also spend a lot of time going to places like Maker Faire and hanging out in places like Tech Shop. And we're seeing how lots of really cool tools and technology and software was allowing people to really unleash their creativity. This past, this past year at Maker Faire, one of the people that we met was actually Skylar. And here we were thinking we were the young, cool, hip people. And Skylar, as you can see, he's way younger and way hipper and way cooler than we were. And he was telling, about, uh, telling us about lots of the projects that, that he was making with his MakerBot, and even offered to teach us a couple of things. So here's a kid, and he's about half our age. And I was going to say about half our height, but with that lift, he might be a little bit taller than us by now. Um, and he was making these really amazing projects using a lot of creativity and a lot of really cool technology that is really amazing, but also increasingly accessible. 
So it, it started us thinking, what would happen if we took some of these tools, technologies, and mindsets that we saw at Maker Faire and transplanted them into the classroom? So we decided to find out. With the help of some friends, some strangers, and some sponsors such as Autodesk, we were able to get a truck, fill it with a bunch of tools, and start running workshops in the Bay Area. So we're going to show you some pictures of inside of the truck and the outside of our truck. Uh, we have a bunch of really cool tools. We have um, a, 3D, a couple 3D printers, a uh, laser cutter, but we also have some lower tech tools like glue guns and, of course, duct tape. So we spent a couple of months hanging out in the Bay Area, running workshops in local elementary and middle schools, and the response that we got was really encouraging. Teachers and students told us that our workshops was some of the most fun that they've had over in, in the past many years, and we started getting emails from people all over the country. So we decided to take the plunge and start driving it a little bit further. So this map is actually on this big screen, it's pretty close to full scale. Um, we started out in California, and we visited a lot of different places. We drove 15,323 miles um, over a little bit under four months, visited 33 states, 73 cities, and ran over 200 workshops with around 2,700 students. Um, and we went to really fun places like Texas in the middle of August, which was not super comfortable. Uh, we went to Manhattan while the UN General Assembly, Education Nation, and the Clinton Global Initiative was there. Also not a great time to be there in terms of driving and parking, but we survived. And we actually ended up back in LA at uh, the LAPD in South Central. So <laughs> we, we spanned the gamut of really interesting places to go to. But in all these places, we tried to impart a really simple three-step design process of brainstorming, prototyping, and storytelling. So all of our workshops begin with the brainstorming process. And for us, we think this is one of the most important ideas of the whole thing. We start having the kids make a list. So sometimes it's a list of animals, sometimes it's a list of things that they might find in a city, and sometimes it's a list of problems that they see in their community. But no matter what it is, it's always a list. And while list making might not seem like a super important skill, for a lot of these students, it's the first time that they've really gotten to think unfiltered in the school environment. There's no right answer, there's no answer key, and they're just allowed to write down the first thing that comes to their mind without having to worry about who's gonna see it, what their teacher's gonna think, or what grade they might get on the assignment. So here, as you can see in the picture, these students are brainstorming lists of animals. So we ask them to come up with a list of all the animals they can think of that live underwater, and a list of all the animals they can think of that live on land. So what they do once they have those two lists is they pick one on each list, and then they combine them to make a new creature. So um, a lot of times we have combinations of sharks and tigers or turtles and lizards, and you can imagine what those might look like if you're you know, a fifth grader and drawing pictures. Um, so once they draw these pictures, we have them actually build it. We want them to make a robot that simulates this creature that they've created. And that's the prototyping phase, and that comes next. So a lot of times the students, when we're telling them, you know, you're just gonna build this, and here's some materials, ready, set, go, they kind of look at us and you know, maybe they look up a little bit, and, um, and they say, but, but I don't know how to do that. How do I connect that? What does this look like? And we always kind of just look at each other and say, I don't know, what do you think? Inevitably, the students kind of pout in the corner for a little bit. They're not sure exactly what to do, but they always figure it out, and that's the most important part. And always at the end of the class, the students that really were stuck at the beginning are the most proud of what they created, because they didn't know what to do, and then they themselves were able to figure it out without someone telling them how to do it. So at the end, once everyone's designed their own creature or element of a city or whatever else it is that we're working on, we have the storytelling phase, and that's, that's the end. So that's when the students have a chance to all come together, share what they created, share with us, share with their teachers, but then also take a moment to reflect on what it is they did. And this reflection's really key because that's when people begin to view themselves as a designer. And that's what allows them to think that they can really change the world and they can change the current situation and they can change the future. So Jason's gonna tell you a little bit about one student in particular that really struck us. So early on in our trip, we met a student named Brooke and we ran a workshop for school and a couple weeks later, we received a video in our, inbo in our inbox. And the video was of Brooke telling us about a new invention that she'd created. And it was to help her pick up trash in her schoolyard. So Brooke had been walking around her around the school and seeing that there was a lot of litter and she wanted a way to make it a cleaner place. So instead of asking her teacher to clean it up or 
waiting for someone else to fix the problem. She, she decided to take action and create something to do something herself. So she created a device that allowed her to hold a bag and also hold trash and then dispose of the bag when she was done picking up the trash. And this is just a really great example of how design not only can help students plan out their future, but also create change in their current environments. And for us, as we've been sort of traveling around the country, going to places like this, getting a blizzard from Dairy Queen in the middle of Washington, uh, we've also done a lot of prototyping ourselves. Uh, our, our truck didn't come with the vents that help you direct air conditioning in a truck. So instead of pointing towards us, it was actually bowing right out the window. And while that was all fine and dandy while we were driving around the Bay Area where everything, every single day it's about 70 degrees, by the time we started heading through the Southwest, through Las Vegas and Arizona, we figured that we needed to make some really quick changes, otherwise we would soon be melted on the floor of our truck. So one day when we were driving around, I was sitting in the passenger seat and I was trying to look around for things that I could do to hack something together to fix this problem, and I saw some cardboard from an old workshop, I saw a pair of scissors, and I saw a pair of, uh, a roll of blue painter's tape, and I cut a couple squares of cardboard, taped it together, and in a couple minutes we had something that kept us cool throughout the summer, so we're really excited about that. But as we sort of plan the road ahead for Spark Truck and think about how we can onboard new students so we can keep Spark Truck going and spark more young designers around the country, we're really excited to see what these young designers and makers are going to create um, and build a future for the world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jason and Rachel. Ann Filson and Gary Workbacher have had distinguished careers as traditional architects working on big projects with world-renowned firms. However, they decided they wanted something different. They wanted something that keeps the environment front of mind. They wanted something that helps create local jobs. And they wanted something that allows designers to get their designs directly into the hands of consumers. They wanted to create a new model for how professional des designers can, cre can create and, get and produce their objects. With their project at Fab, which might be described as local vor for stuff, they're doing that with furniture. And this is one of their tables up here. So please welcome Ann and Gary. <laughs> Well, thank you, Eric, um, and thanks to Autodesk for inviting us. This is, um, was a really um, great provocation. Um, everyone is a designer um, for us, as you'll see. Um, it's something that's very close to Gary and myself in our um, process. So is everyone a designer? If you posed this question to many of our colleagues, you'd get one answer, quite likely, no. <laughs> um, but we think that this is really how you define design. Um, if you define design as simply recognizing the agency you have within you to change the world around you, um, and you act on that agency, then you're a designer. So everyone could be a designer. Um, typically, we see design um, culturally as you know, the creation of an object um, that's handed over or handed down to a client or to a consumer. But really, if you look at design as constructing relationships between culture, objects, nature, and technology, you can start to see that we're all designing at some point in our lives in varying, to varying degrees and in varying contexts. Um, many, you know, who would actually call, who do call themselves designers by these terms may not be designing. But on the flip side, many who never would ever think to call themselves designers are doing great things to change the world. If you look at the entire maker movement, there are, you know, obviously incredible things happening. And, you know, there are quite a few examples on this stage today um, as well. And so really, um, you know, we want to live in a world where everyone is a designer and where everyone is recognizing that agency. 
And if you look at the arc of history, it's kind of moving in that direction. Um, if you look at constructed perspective, um, which is something that um, Renaissance painters developed, and essentially an open source tool to faithfully represent the world around them. Um, that, and then that open source tool is adopted by architects to represent the world um, around them and to actually um, represent the change they wanted to see. It really has aided us in doing what we want to do. And another example is um, the conceptual work by the conceptual artist um, Saul Lewitt in the 1960s. Um, Saul Lewitt wrote scripts or instructions for others to actually complete his artwork. So he was radically transforming the nature of what the artist was and what the, what the artwork was you know, by this gesture. And so you see on the left um, one of his instructions um, for a wall mural. And then on the right, you see an example of a wall mural that was created by others. Another example is um, the uh, product designer, um, Italian product designer Enzo Mari who developed autoprogettazione, which roughly translated from the Italian to English is self-projects, or um, DIY. And if you sent Enzo Mari a self-addressed stamped envelope, um, he would send you a booklet of instructions to make um, furniture, um, do-it-yourself furniture, out of any kind of, um, or sort of readily available materials. And similar to, similarly to this, you, see, you look at the Instructables, um, where there's something going on for everything. Um, Instructables, you know, has cracked, on, the, on Instructables you can find, um, you know, people, you can find examples where people have cracked the code of, you know, almost anything, um, and it enables others to make, make things. And when you combine that with um, all of the, the the affordable digital tools and other resources and platforms online, you start to realize that we all have the, the, the tools and the ability to be designers. And so for AtFab, um, Gary and I were really inspired by this, this kind of emerging culture of makers. And we wanted to engage it somehow in our work. Um, and so we are trying to find that line between DIY and design um, in AtFab. And we also really wanted to provoke consumers to become makers. So AtFab is a series of furniture pieces, furniture objects that are downloadable. Um, and, for, and so you can download them anywhere um, and make, make an AtFab piece with a CNC router um, a laser cutter or a, a water jet machine. And these are, um, this is a map of um, all of the downloads we've had from our website um, of at Fab Furniture Objects. And, you know, makers, you know, worldwide. Um, it's been pretty inspiring, actually, to, to have that reception. Um, and so, to, to enable you to, to enable makers to customize at Fab, um, we, 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 Gary and I developed um, half a dozen uh, parametric definitions, which you see here. And each of these enables, enables you to control the, the shape or the dimensions or the material thickness of a furniture piece. And what we realized when we were developing these parameters is that it was actually taking us much more, a much greater effort to, de to design the parameters that it ever required, it ever demanded of us to design the objects themselves. And what we found was that we had to determine um, how can someone get structural stability, um, functional performance, and durability um, in their furniture piece, at the same time having unlimited choice or maximizing choice. And so that was um, an incredible challenge and also an interesting finding in the process of developing the project. And so we were very inspired by um, uh, complexity theory and the principle of emergence, the idea that, from, that 
much comes from little. And so our 12 furniture pieces were um, based on a, a, a very fundamental set of um, details and structural assemblies. If you, and then you overlay the six parametric definitions on those 12 furniture objects, you get infinite versions, or much from little. Okay, so uh, Anne and I are, as was mentioned, uh, both educated as architects, and we've worked at a lot of big firms on big projects with big budgets. And uh, on those projects, we've used all of the most powerful parametric software. So in this project, for instance, we used uh, generative components, digital project, a little grasshopper, and of course, uh, a healthy dose of Revit. Um, the, uh, but, but what we became interested in with AtFab was the question, would it be possible to share the power of parametric tools with anyone, with all the people that we just mentioned who uh, are sort of would-be designers or, or, or would-be makers? How, could we, let's say, share this tool that's usually exclusively uh, limited to architects and professionals with anyone uh, who wanted to be a maker or a designer. So if you go to our website, uh, atfab.co, that's atfab.co, uh, you'll find half a dozen uh, what we call uh, personal parametric interfaces, where you can, uh, on, you know, on the coffee table page, there's sliders which allow you to uh, transform the height and the length and the width of your piece. And uh, we, it was a kind of fascinating challenge to design for transformation rather than for a, a kind of single outcome. So there are, there are tables which transform from a side table to a dining table to a conference table. And we started to learn about this whole sort of uh, principles of, of growth and transformation through uh, leveraging the, the power of parametric tools. But this time, we were trying to share it with anyone who wanted to take it up as a challenge to make their own piece of furniture. So uh, to describe the kind of power of a parametric uh, interface, um, and also to describe a little bit about the difference in this design challenge, I wanted to describe one definition that we worked with for a long time. Uh, on all of the interfaces for the pieces of furniture, there's a material thickness uh, parameter or definition, which means that someone with a, uh, a kind of extravagant budget could make a chair or two chairs out of a piece of five millimeter ultralight aircraft composite, and they could go to uh, you know, a highly skilled technician who could make it for them on a, uh, a flow jet machine, of course at great expense, or they could make the same two chairs out of a three-quarter inch piece of plywood for 30 bucks and whatever it costs for time on their ShopBot router. So in this way, we were trying to, uh, let's say, have, uh, allow the furniture to be both high and low based on the means of the people who were downloading the files. The other great challenge that we had to face was um, Traditionally, and even as in, in our education as designers, the goal was a kind of fixed and finite outcome, a, a kind of ideal object that was a superlative of some kind, most beautiful, most green, most expensive. Um, but our goal with AtFab and the challenge became how to design for the broadest range possible, how to design to accommodate as much choice as possible. And really, uh, the, the challenge as a designer to kind of leave something in a state of becoming, where it's finished in a certain sense, but actually still left open for other possibilities uh, for anyone, we call them sort of collaborators at a distance, to pick up where we left off and uh, make something of their own with the kind of seed that we provided. So. 
Um, another part of our agenda for ATFAB was really trying to create an alternative to the centralized factory. Um, how could we design for distributed manufacturing and keep, um, keep objects or things um, in their information state for as, as long as possible before they actually become stuff. I think we're all well aware that there are so many you know, of our possessions in our households have been shipped around the world. You know, and, um, and we really like the idea of shipping information rather than our stuff. <laughs> So we explained design as being um, the, the kind of constructing relationships between culture, things, nature, and technology. And um, Gary and I were elated to read this tweet a few months ago um, from someone we didn't know, half the country away, who had downloaded the cut file for our side chairs. And he took his, he, he took his date to a local hacker space and they made these chairs out of um, some plywood that they had at the space. And we couldn't help to think that, you know, this is what design is, or this is what design can be. And um, it felt like a real success of the project when, you know, when this emerged. And so, finally, um, one of the provocations for this panel was, um, are the Jetsons hype? And I think a lot of um, designers will probably say, you know, they became designers um, sometimes because of the Jetsons, because of the optimism and the technology um, and, you know, the promise that that, that lovely um, cartoon shows us. And, um, and we really do actually believe that, um, that the Jetsons aren't hype, that the future and the promise of the Jetsons is entirely possible, but it's going to take everyone to be a designer to get us there. Thank you. Ben Kaufman is a successful entrepreneur and product designer. While he's designed, manufactured, marketed, and sold consumer products himself, what really distinguishes Ben is that He's also guided others through this process and does so at scale with his company, Quirky. The team of expert product designers at Quirky works with their community of inventors to bring three new consumer products to market every week. Since the products are designed in a social and open fashion, they simultaneously build a market for the product while they're also designing the product. Quirky's developed over 250 products and they're sold in all of the traditional retailers that you've heard of. To Ben, there's no question that everyone is a designer because he's already helping them take their designs into stores. Please welcome Ben Kaufman. Hi. Oh, great. What's up, man? You're everywhere. Wired Magazine, every conference. It's awesome. Everyone should give Bree a round of applause because he's, he's actually making everyone a designer uh, from MakerBot. Um, Welcome. I am, I'm from New York, uh, and, and I love the city. And, and, and when, I, when I open my window every morning, and if I peek my head out at just the right angle, I get to see the most beautiful sight in the world. It's actually the, the Empire State Building. Does anyone know how long it took to build the Empire State Building? Any guesses? The crown jewel of New York, one of the best pieces of architecture in the world. A year and 45 days to build the most gorgeous building in our fair city. Does anyone know how long it took OXO International, the preeminent kitchen gadget company, to develop this fucking potato peeler? Anyone? Almost three years to develop a potato peeler. Now I'm trying to prove a point here, uh, besides for for getting you guys all, all, all jazzed and, and woken up. And that is the fact that when we, as a people, put our mind to something, we can do great things. 11 years later, and we still don't have a Freedom Tower. Does anyone know what this is? Lockheed P-80, the first fighter jet in the world. Does anyone know how long this took to build? 143 days from, hey, let's, let's make a fighter jet, 
to a, a jet in the sky dropping bombs on people. Um, now, again, 143 days. 50 years ago, we designed the fastest commercial jet in the world. This was 50 years ago, before global positioning systems, before like automated flight systems, before really computers had anything. And this is still the fastest commercial jet in the world. Boeing spent, I think, $10 billion over the last uh, seven years to make their jets 4% uh, more efficient. We've become an incremental culture. Invention has been replaced with innovation. Now, there's a reason why all this is happening, and, and, and the reality of it is the fact that people are afraid to, to make. People are afraid to take on the challenges we used to, uh, uh, we used to take on, and, and, and as a result, we've become, again, an incremental culture, just trying to make things better versus inventing new. Uh, this is a great example. This is the, uh, a quote from the, the CEO of P&G. Uh, we haven't created anything new or meaningful in quite some time. This is why uh, he was saying his, his earnings were way down. Um, well, I'm going to tell you a couple stories today. Uh, the first is about uh, the, the company I work for, a bunch of crazy people locked in a glass conference room in New York at Quirky. We actually launched three brand new consumer products every single week. That says we launch three brand new consumer products every week. The, the text is just sort of condensed. Every Tuesday at 12, every Thursday at 12, and every Friday at 12, regardless of what's going on in the world, we launch a brand new physical good. Now, these are ideas coming from people all around the world, people we've never met. We set out to do one thing, and that is to make the act of, wow, all my text is messed up, uh, <laughs> make the act of invention accessible. Uh, this slide says making products is hard. It is. This is a list, hopefully you can read it. No, you can't. It's all right. Uh, this is a list of, uh, uh, of all of the things you need to do in order to bring a product out into the world. We heard a little bit from all the other speakers, all the things they needed to do, all the machines they needed to learn how to run. Uh, but that's just the beginning. Once you go from zero to one, you have to go from one to many. And that is the hard part, manufacturing, logistics, merchandising, retail. Retail sucks. All of these different things in order to push a product into the real world, in order to, to realize the American dream. And the result of all of this is that the brightest minds in the world are no longer working on making fighter jets and beautiful skyscrapers. Instead, they're working on making mobile games that you could sort of throw virtual sheep at each other. That's, that's sort of what's going on out there. And that is why at Quirky, oh, look, you fixed it. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, that is why we set out again to make invention accessible. How does this work? We leverage three distinct parties. Number one is a beautiful technology system. Next is a community of hundreds of thousands of people all around the world who share and collaborate and, and yell at each other about, about ideas and, 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 and concepts. And the last is an expert team. We put all of these three things together, and the result is three gorgeous, brand new products every single week. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> most companies spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, uh, creating brand new physical goods. At Quirky, we do it for between five dollars and $50,000 for a brand new product. Doesn't matter what type of thing it is, whether it's the most high-end consumer electronic that will show off at CES, uh, right here in a few months, or just a simple kitchen gadget. It takes a few days and a, a, a couple thousand bucks, and it's out into the world. It's on the shelves of retailers. It all happens on Quirky.com, where, where again, everyone gathers. They share their ideas. I'm going to tell you one story now. It's a guy named Jake. Jake uh, was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when NASA, like spaceship NASA, came around and said, we want kids to be designers. Uh, they should have talked to this guy over here. Hey, man. Um, <laughs> But Jake was in high school at the time, and um, he did what most high school students do to submit into this competition. He made a trifold board. He found a problem. He did some research, and, and, uh, and then he came up with a concept. He actually won the NASA product design competition, which netted him a t-shirt and a pat on the back. Um, now, Jake's idea was for a revolutionary power strip, but Jake couldn't commercialize a revolutionary power strip with a pat on the back and a t-shirt. Instead, he sat on it for years and years until he heard about Quirky. He submitted it to the site, and, uh, and we began working on it. This is our Thursday afternoon product evaluation where the best ideas in the world bubble up to the top. And by the end of each one of these Thursday at 7 p.m. meetings, which are live stream around the world, we crown between three and five brand new inventors. 
Luckily for Jake, we made his product. It's called the Pivot Power, uh, the first articulating power strip in the world. Uh, Jake, this is an outdated slide. Jake, Jake will make over a half a million dollars this year. This product's available at some of the best retailers in the world, from Apple to uh, CVS, one of the greatest retailers in the world, uh, no, uh, uh, to Apple and Best Buy and Target, etc. Now, I want to get back to where I started. This whole concept of, of progress and invention and innovation. Imagine a world a hundred years from now. A hundred years from now. You've just seen the most amazing tools. You've seen a 12-year-old smarter than, than, than Einstein. Like you've seen all of these things. One hundred years from now, imagine the world you're going to be living in. Got it? Got your jetpack on? Fantastic. Okay, so let's go back a hundred years. 1909. Mr. Henry Ford and, 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 and Model C, this is, this is obviously the first commercial automobile. It was black, it, uh, it was sort of SUV-like. It actually got 17 miles a gallon. First form of, of mass transportation. 100 years later, 2009, the best-selling car in America, it was still a Ford. It was black. And it got 16 miles a gallon instead of 17. That, ladies and gentlemen, is 100 years of American progress. Um, <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but the, the picture I painted in my mind of what the world's going to look like 100 years from now, it didn't look like the incremental improvement we had over the last 100 years. It looks a hell of a lot different. But in order to do that, we need to all understand that we need to participate in that process. We need to take on the great challenges of building the skyscrapers and inventing brand new things. A hundred days of progress at Quirky, this community of people that are gathering uh, and, and, and talking about brand new stuff. This happened, uh, I think, around February, end of February, beginning of March this year. A college student in Atlanta, Georgia, looked around her room. She saw everyone was using crates, like milk crates, for things other than storing milk, okay? Uh, they were using it for, for clothing and, and storage of, of all sorts of things, but they weren't using it for milk. So she said, well, maybe there's a way to design a milk crate, which was beautiful. A milk crate that I would love to have in my home, a beautiful modular furniture system that was well-priced just like the milk crate is, but actually fits into my home decor. Now, in 100 days, we picked the idea off of the website Community of people from all around the world participated. Our expert designers were involved. We found a tool shop right across the river from our office in New Jersey who made a steel tool the size of a refrigerator. We found a molder up in Vermont. And 100 days later, we were shipping a beautiful modular storage system to the best retailers in the world, Target, Staples, etc. A gorgeous system. It went from zero to a million dollars in four days. This is Jenny Drinker, the inventor. Now, the beautiful thing about Quirky is it's not just the inventor, it's the people that help them. There is no one designer, there is no sole genius. In order for Jake's power strip to become real, there were 709 of what we call influencers, people who made a real-world impact in making that product real. This is the instruction manual for, for the Pivot Power. As soon as you get through the part where it tells you not how to, how to not burn your house down, there are the names and the corresponding ownership percentages of the 709 people who helped Jake make the product real. They all get paid every time one unit of the product sells. Now when we talk about why everyone needs to be a designer, or why everyone is a designer, it comes down to one simple quote. It's from another awesome Benjamin. He says, tell me and I'll forget. Tell me something in passing, it's just gonna, it's gonna just flow right through my mind. If you show me, I'll make a visual connection. I might remember. But if you involve me, I'll truly understand. I'll understand, Quirky, why your power strip costs $30 instead of the two-pack for $5. I'll understand why you made that product pink or chamfered that corner or rounded that edge. And because of that, I'll respect your band, brand. I'll be an evangelist for what you're trying to do. And I will tell all my friends that they, too, can be designers. This is how we spread things, and this is how we will wind up taking on the big, gigantic, meaty challenges that made us the country we now are. We're all a designer. We always have been. Just a matter of pushing down those barriers once again. So 
thank you all. I appreciate it. So we've spoken today about uh, journeys, journeys that are physical and journeys that are metaphorical. And I think that's really apt because a journey starts with a single step. If you're thinking about becoming a designer, maybe that single step is starting to draw something. If you already are a designer, maybe you should go a little bit beyond. Maybe you should go and learn something that's out of your discipline, out of your comfort zone. Go program a microcontroller, go learn one of these new rapid prototyping tools, go see what's going on in Quirky. And so, if everyone isn't already a designer, I think these five stories today have shown us that everyone can become a designer. Let's thank the speakers again. Thank you very much.